Good morning. Everyone is really, I didn't say chipper this morning, quite loud. My goodness. What a joy it is. So let's talk about death. No, in seriousness, we are going to talk about death today. And what a joy it is that we get to do this. Because when we look at a world like this past week, hearing about a, an apartment building collapsing in Florida, or you hear about people being shot, and you hear about death, people getting sick with maybe new virus a new virus, new strain of virus, whatever it might be, there's death all around us. But this is what we get to have, great joy. And we get to celebrate, not like the world does and just ignore it, but we get to address death with the one who is able to conquer death itself, with Jesus Christ. Let's worship him and celebrate his work for our salvation by singing our very first hymn, hymn 145, Please note the verses if you're following along in the hymnal. Verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Jesus lives, the victory is won. begin the order of service. If you're following along in the hymnal, it's the service of the word on page 38. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from earth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me, 
according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from all sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, then, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need. And keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. We look now to the Word of God, and as we look at God's Word today, our first lesson really hits off what we will talk about. The Lord is my portion, we'll read in this section, and how joyous it is that no matter what we face, whether it's suffering and persecution or even death itself, it is our Lord who holds our lives, it is the Lord who holds our eternal life and brings that to us. We look at our first lesson from Lamentations chapter 3. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are, new, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who, who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. For men are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. Let's sing together now Psalm 30.
We read the second lesson from 2 Timothy chapter 1. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it, is ha but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who, uh, who has destroyed death and has brought, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is, he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. The Lord is good to those who hope in his, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. Alleluia. morning we read from Mark chapter 5 and we read selected verses. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came, to, came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. We're just going to pause for a second and know that we see that there's different verses chosen. What happens now is there is someone who is sick. And we see the power of Jesus. He's able to heal this lady who had been bleeding for many years. But in the meantime then, as Jesus is finishing up and wrapping up this lady's confidence and coming to him, we find some tragic news. And we continue then. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. When they came, home, uh, came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talatakum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We'll sing the hymn of the day, hymn 428, Why Should Cross and Trial Grieve Me?
I'm not afraid of death. A famous comedian once commented, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I was at an art museum, and, and I'm not an art connoisseur by any means, but there was one painting that really made an impression on me. It depicted the ancient philosopher Socrates. He was sitting on a bed surrounded by his friends, his followers, and they are distraught, weeping, covering their faces with grief because of what Socrates is reaching out to grab with his hand. Socrates has been placed on trial. He has been found guilty, and he has been sentenced to death by poison. And the story goes that Socrates could have easily gotten himself off the hook. He was not guilty of the crime he was accused of, and so he could have used his brilliant intellect to prove his innocence. But he didn't, because he didn't see the point. Socrates was not afraid of death. And so rather than fighting it, he simply accepted his fate. He reached out, he drank the poison, and he died. There are times when I'm, I'm like Socrates, who bravely thought about his death. And there are times when I am like the prophet Jeremiah, who wrote our first lesson, sitting amidst the destruction and the death around him, and yet he hoped in the Lord. And there are times when I'm like the Apostle Paul, who wrote our second lesson while he was sitting in prison, facing his impending death, and yet looked to it with confidence. And then there are times when I think about what death really is. That death is God's judgment that I have not lived my life up to his standards. And death only makes visible what is already the natural condition of my heart. And death is what I have earned because of my sin. And in those moments, then I am like Jairus, terrified of death. And in those moments, what can we do besides run to Jesus along with Jairus so that Jesus can do for us just what he did for Jairus? He can give us courage in the face of death. In April of uh, 1942, American and Filipino forces surrendered to the Japanese army after the three-month Battle of Bataan. Uh, and at that time, more than 60,000 prisoners of war were captured. They were then forced to make the grueling 60-mile march to the POW camp. And along the way, no one knows the exact number, but thousands of soldiers died on what is today known as the Bataan Death March. About a century before that, uh, another death march took place in the United States when thousands of Native Americans were forced to leave their homes and relocate. And again, many, many of them died along the way of what we today call the Trail of Tears. And then long, long before that, another death march took place. When Jairus finished bringing his request to Jesus, he turned around and he began to make his way back to his home, where his daughter lay dying. For Jairus, this was a march toward death. This was a trail of tears. And our heart breaks when we think about people marching toward their death. And then, our heart breaks again when we realize that we are marching toward death. This is a, a depressing way of looking at life, but it is true, right? We are just making our way toward death. Every day that we live is another step toward the grave. 
And this was never God's plan. Never his intention that our life be nothing more than a walk toward death. When Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world, as they walked through life, they looked on the horizon and all that they saw was more life. But when humanity stopped walking with God, then we began walking toward death. And our modern medicine it can prolong this walk. It can make this walk less painful. And our hobbies and our vacations, they can help us momentarily forget that we are making this march. But in the end, nothing changes the fact that we are steadily approaching death. Aren't you glad you came this morning? <laughs> this, is a, this is a depressing thought, and it gets maybe a little bit worse. Uh, the only thing worse than making your way toward death would be making your way toward death all by yourself. And this is one of the saddest things we saw in the last year and a half. People in nursing homes and hospitals locked down, approaching death with no one there to hold their hand, no one to listen, no one to speak words of comfort and encouragement. Making your way towards death is hard enough, but doing it by yourself, that is something to be afraid of. And that is something that Jairus was afraid of as well. And you can see that in the request that he brings to Jesus. You know the, the first request he has, right? He says, Jesus, will you please heal my daughter? But did you catch the second request that's hidden underneath that? He says, Jesus, will you please come with me? Jesus, I'm afraid. I'm about to make my way toward the death of my daughter, and I can't do it alone. Jesus, will you please come with me? And you can tell Jairus is maybe a little bit nervous that Jesus is going to see this request as a nuisance. Jesus is so busy. He's been healing and preaching and teaching around the clock. He can't get any rest. He is exhausted. And so Jairus worries that Jesus is going to view this request as a bother. But that day, Jairus learned something very important about his Savior. On that day, Jairus learned that Jesus is a Savior who likes to be bothered. And a Savior who likes to be bothered is a Savior who goes with you toward death, no matter how busy he is. And that gives you courage. Think about a little girl who has to go down into the basement, and so she's afraid. So she goes to her father, and her father is busy doing whatever it is that fathers are always busy doing. And she says, Dad, I have to go to the basement. I'm afraid. Will you please come with me? And the father looks at her, smiles, puts down his phone, closes his laptop, takes her by the hand, and the two of them go down the stairs together. And the fear of that little girl, it's vanished. A Savior who goes with you. You're still approaching death. Nothing changes that. But you're not going alone because your Savior walks next to you, step by step, holding your hand, listening to your prayers, picking you up when you fall, giving you words of comfort and encouragement. Savior who goes with you gives you courage. And you can feel it, can't you? When Jesus takes that very first step to go with Jairus, just a little bit, that fear begins to melt away. And so the two of them, Jesus and Jairus, step by step, make their way toward Jairus' house, surrounded by a great crowd of people. Uh, Pastor Berg mentioned what happens next. It's kind of odd. Uh, Jesus stops, he heals this woman, and he has kind of a long conversation with her. And you can picture Jairus as this is happening, saying, like, can, we, can we hurry this up, Jesus? And sure enough, as Jesus is finishing his conversation with this woman, Jairus gets the message that he has been dreading. This is the moment 
the moment when Jairus is reminded that even though Jesus is walking with him toward death, in the end, death still wins. Because death always wins. Edgar Allan Poe wrote a little story about uh, some angels that gather together to watch a play. And basically, the play is just about people living their ordinary lives. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this play, onto the stage wriggles an enormous red worm, and it devours all of the actors. And the, the distressed angels notice that the title of the play is Man. And the hero of the play is the conqueror worm. Death always wins. And at some point, we all have moments where we are reminded of this truth. Jairus had one of those moments, and so will you. You look around at the room and you wonder, which of us will have one of these moments in the next year, the next month, this, this week? Death always wins. And in the end, maybe five, maybe 50, maybe 100 years from now, you will have become just another notch on death's belt. Because death always wins. It's undefeated. But here's what I propose. In the record book where death's perfect record is listed, I propose that we put an asterisk next to it. Because while death always wins, it's Jesus who gets the last word. Death might be the conqueror, but death has been conquered by Christ. Here's how the writer to the Hebrews says it. He says, since God's children have flesh and blood, Jesus shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus destroys death. And how does he do it? Well, he did it on a Friday morning when he approached death all by himself. With no one there to hold his hand, no one to listen to him, no one to give him words of comfort or encouragement. And on that day, another father mourned the loss of his little child. There's a video you can find on YouTube. It tells the story of a, a man who operates a train, uh, like drawbridge, right? So a river goes underneath, the train bridge goes up and down so trains can cross. Uh, one day this man brings his son with him to work, and his son is seven or eight. Uh, and his son is just kind of playing around the area. And eventually the first train begins to approach the bridge, so the man reaches out to, to pull the lever, lower the bridge, when he notices out of the corner of his eye that his son is playing in the, the gears of the bridge. And if that lever is pulled, then his son will be crushed. And so he, right, he shouts, he screams, trying, trying to warn his son, but he's too far away. There's no time to run because the train is approaching, and so it's the hideous choice, right? The life of his son, the life of the people on the train. And as the train crosses over the bridge, the passengers look out the window and they wonder what could have possibly happened to cause this bridge operator to be bent over, wailing with grief. It's a video that tugs at the heartstrings, and yet it doesn't quite capture what happened on Good Friday. Because on Good Friday, certainly the sky went dark as the father mourned the loss of his son. And yet what happened that day was no tragic accident. It was the father's deliberate plan to destroy death for you. And the son who lost his life was no helpless child. This is the one for whom raising the dead is as easy as waking someone from a nap. And this is the one who goes to a house full of people who are crying and mourning because a little girl has died, and he tells them to stop crying. 
And this is the one who goes into the room where the dead body of the girl lies on the bed. And he tells her to get up. And she does. And so will you. Talithakum. This is the word that drove the fear out of Jairus' heart. And this is the word that allowed Jeremiah to sit amidst the death surrounding him and yet hope in the Lord. And this is the word that allowed the Apostle Paul to face his impending death with courage. And this is the word that inspired the hymn writer to pray, Lord, teach me to live that I may dread the grave as little as my bed. Talithakum. Little child, I say to you, Get up. And you will. And then, like Jairus, you will be completely astonished. Talithakum. And then, like Jeremiah, you will say, Lord, great is your faithfulness. Talithakum. And then, Paul says, the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Talithakum. And then, the hymn writer says, I know not, oh, I know not what joys await us there. Talithakum. The last word. The word that drives out fear forever. Talithakum. Little child, I say to you, get up. Amen. Why don't we all get up? <laughs> and we'll express our faith in our life giving Savior using the words of the Apostles' Creed I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated as we worship God through our offering.
please stand. We go to our Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, our Good Shepherd, we pray that you will be with us while we live in this world filled with death. As we've witnessed this past week in a, in a collapsing of a building, at the news of death, we are brought once again to repentance because death comes into this world because of sin. All of us are sinful and deserve death. Therefore, let us know each day the victory and the assurance of your grace. Give us faith to know even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we, have no, we fear no evil, for you are with me. You will comfort us. Comfort us with the assurance that you have redeemed us from all sin, from death and from the power of the devil, and that we are yours whether we live or die, all because of your gift to us. Enable us to face death, to believe in your glorious resurrection from death. Give us joy in knowing that you have brought life and immortality to light. Give us the blessed hope that in you all will be made alive and that we too shall live again. Thank you for the victory over the eternal consequences of sin and death. Send to us now the Holy Spirit through the word to preserve our faith until we reach our heavenly home. Jesus, we thank you for preserving both the soul and the body. Thank you for being with Paul Kaler during this past week when he had surgery. Bless him as he convalesces. Preserve all who are traveling in the next week. Enable the conversations of all of us um, as we engage with our friends, our neighbors, and our coworkers and families over this holiday. May you bless the conversations that they may bring you glory. And may we build others up in all that we do. As we prepare for the, to celebrate the fourth, give us time this week to bow our heads and to bend our knees in prayer to you, thanking you for the peace we have in this country so that we can worship you. Hear our private petitions this week that we will also offer up on behalf of our families, our friends, and our country. To your name be all honor and glory in all that we do. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Let's celebrate the victory that we have in Christ by singing our next hymn, hymn 211, I Know of a Sleep in Jesus' Name.
of prayer and blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please remain standing for our final hymn where we thank the Lord that we will be forever with him. Hymn 213. Good morning to everyone. I'm glad you could be here. Glad we could worship and celebrate the victory that we have over death in Christ. Just a few things I want to highlight. We know that Vacation Bible School is, is coming here very quickly in the next month. It'll be July 19th through the 23rd. If you want to sign up, sign up online. Uh, this is kind of nice. We, didn't get, we weren't able to have this last year, but we get to do that this summer, so we're going to rejoice in that. Um, we're asking uh, still for if there are some teens that would like to volunteer and help out uh, leading children, uh, the groups of children around. We'd love to have um, as many helpers as possible. We'll also, if you're signing your children up, if you could help provide for the snacks during the week for the couple dozen cookies, that's usually what we give for our snack during VBS. That would be appreciated too. I invite you all now, uh, after service here, after you, you talk with each other for a little bit, to take part in our Bible classes where we're going to continue to look at our scripture lessons downstairs in the church fellowship hall. And then there is a family Bible study where we're going to continue our overview of the promise of the Savior in God's Word. I think that's all we have to announce. We will have worship next weekend, but no Bible study next weekend. But everyone, we know that you, many of you may be traveling or have family in town. Monday nights have great option to come in and, and catch worship after a busy, crazy weekend. God's blessings to all of you. Enjoy your week.